Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we'll be continuing our look at the method of sections, applying it to uh, shear and bending moment diagrams. In the previous lecture, we uh, investigated what the method of sections is in relation to shear and moment diagrams, and we explored some of the uh, particular issues and considerations that need to be applied uh, when using the method of sections to find uh, a shear and moment uh, diagram for a beam of various sorts. Now, in the previous lecture, we just sort of introduced and discussed the method qualitatively, and in this video, we're going to be working through a series of long-form examples applying the method of sections to the determination of shear and bending moment diagrams and the determination of moments at a particular location in a beam. All right, so uh, there are two main things that we can use the method of sections for, and I want to explore both of them in this video. So there's a few things we could, well, there's basically two ways we can apply this. One is to find a shear and moment, I'm just going to say V and M, at a point. And two, uh, to find V and M, if I can manage to write an ampersand correctly, uh, V and M uh, across an entire beam. Or, in other words, we're solving for uh, not the shear and moment at a particular point, but at, in terms of x, where x is a distance from uh, the left hand, or I suppose you could even do it from the right hand side of the beam. Now, um, now at first glance, it may seem, why would you ever do the first one? Why would you ever want to find it a single, at a single point? When you could find it uh, across the entire beam as a function of x, well, uh, why you'd want to do that is that obviously, uh, well, maybe not obviously, but uh, the first method is going to be simpler. The math is going to be a little bit simpler. Uh, we're not going to have to do uh, as quite a much, uh, quite a bit of uh, calculations because we're just uh, solving again for the shear moment at a single point. Uh, whenever you try to do something in terms of x, the math, of course, becomes a little more complicated, although not uh, overbearingly so. We're not even dealing with integrals yet. All of this is just uh, straight algebra and simple functions. Anyway, so we're going to explore both, and um, remember the point of shear and moment diagrams generally is to figure out the locations of maximum shear and moment, but there may be times where you by default already know where the maximum shear and moment are, and you're just trying to figure out uh, what the magnitude of those maximum moments are. For example, if I have a uh, simply supported beam with a uniform load across it, yep, um, yeah, there's like a constant uniform load. If I have something like this, I automatically know that the maximum shear is going to be on the ends of the beam and the maximum moment will be at the center of the beam. So in that case, I'm not really that, in I may not be that interested in uh, the shear and moment function as a continuous function across the beam. All I might want to know is the maximum shear at the edges and the maximum moment at the center. And in that case, it would be, might be beneficial to find uh, the moment at a single point, for example, by applying the method of sections, not in terms of x, but just using the first method as just solving for a, the shear and moment at a single location within a beam. All right, so the general thing we're going to look at, or the general process that we're going to use today is that we're going to start simple, uh, we'll start with some simple examples, and then uh, grow increasingly uh, complicated, or we'll start looking at increasingly uh, complex examples. So let's start by just, and uh, remember how there are two methods or two applications of the method of sections for shear and moment, uh, for shear and moment diagrams. The first is where we're just looking for the shear and moment at a single point, and the second is where we're looking for the shear and moment uh, at all locations along the beam by uh, solving as a function of x. So um, I, we're going to work with the first method uh, first, just trying to find the shear and moment at a single point. So uh, let's say, in fact, let's actually go and do a very simple example uh, like we looked at previously. And let's say we have a uniform load across a beam. Uh, like so, and let's say it has a, uh, a magnitude of two kips per foot. And let's say the beam has a length of 20 feet. Like so. And then let's further say that I am interested in the shear and moment at, say, location A and B. So here's going to be B, here's going to be A, and let's put A 
uh, let's see, this whole thing is 20 feet long. I want B to be at the center, so I'll say maybe this is a, from A to B is a distance of three feet, and from the left side of the beam to point A is seven feet. So let's find the shear and moment. Um, let's find the shear and moment at point A and point B, where point uh, A is seven feet from the left end of the beam, and point B is right at the center. Okay, so let's first get point A. And recall, the whole idea of the method of sections is that we're going to cut the beam at a location, at a certain location, uh, at the location where we're interested in finding the shear and moment, and then we're going to assume positive shear and positive moment based on the uh, sign convention that we've previously explored. And then we'll just go and apply uh, statics, or apply, uh, yeah, essentially apply statics, apply equations of equilibrium to calculate the shear and moment at the location we're interested in. So first, uh, find... Oh, maybe I could call this VA, the shear at A, and MA, the moment at A. And to do this, I'm going to draw out the beam, the section of the beam that we're cutting. And this is going to be seven feet long. Now, um, I probably do want to find the reactions. Those are going to be useful. And because this is a two kit per foot long beam, and because this is symmetric, that's going to be very, well, because it's a uniform load and because it's a, a symmetric beam, that's going to be very simple. I can just say that the reactions at both A and B, or both left end and right end, the reaction force is just going to be uh, two kips per foot uh, times a length of 20 feet uh, divided by two. There, this is a symmetric beam, and there are uh, just two vertical reactions, one on each side. So therefore, I can apply symmetry and say that the same uh, the same vertical reaction force is going to be applied at both supports. So multiply that and divide, and I get 20 kips for my reaction force. So there's a 20 kip reaction force here, and a 20 kip reaction force here. Okay, so now I can go ahead and draw a free body diagram of my cut section, the section of the beam from the left-hand side to point A. And so I have a, a 20 kip force over here, on the left hand side. Then um, I'm going to have my uniform load applied across the top and that is my uh, two kip per foot load like here. And then by cutting at point A I have revealed um, some internal forces and I'm going to assume a positive shear which again on the right hand side of an, of, a, of an element represents a downward force. And then moment, which on the right hand side of the element represents a, a positive moment, which on the right hand side of an element would be going uh, counterclockwise. So I'll have MA and VA. The shear and moment at point A. So now let's go ahead and calculate those. Oh, actually one other thing I need to do before I can get those is I need to get the equivalent point force for this distributed load. And that's not going to be too bad. All I have to do is just say, okay, well, two kips per foot um, times seven feet is a total load of 14 kips. Simple enough. Uh, 14 kips. And because this is a uniform load, the centroid of that load is halfway down. So this is then a distance of 3.5 feet. Simple enough. Uh, now I'm going to apply equilibrium in order to calculate the uh, VA and MA. So let's get that. Let's get. I hate it when that happens. Pardon me. A little light air here. Derp. All right. <laughs> anyway, so let's go ahead and try this. So I'm going to do a summation of forces in the vertical direction. By doing a summation of forces in the vertical direction, I have my downward forces and my upward forces. And I'll apply the positive and negative, uh, I'll apply positives and negatives as needed. So I'll have a upward force of 20 kips from the reaction on the left, minus 14 kips, and this is from the uh, equivalent uh, point force, the equivalent point force of this distributed load, and then minus VA. And then this has to equal zero, and again VA is negative because it's pointing downward. Now, I know this can be a bit confusing for students because you're, um, didn't I just say that, that shear was positive in this orientation? And it is. However, it's important to keep in mind that when we do a summation of forces in the uh, vertical direction, we, do, we uh, apply the actual direction that the shear arrows are pointing. 
Okay, so then we solve for VA. VA is going to be equal to simply 20 kips minus 14 kips, or 6 kips. And it's going to, um, it is going to be positive shear, or in other words, in the downward direction, because we are on the right-hand side of an element. Next, I'm going to go, go ahead and get the moment. So summation of moments at point A, counterclockwise positive. I will have the 20 kip force. Uh, this will be generating a negative or clockwise moment about point A. And it will have, so I'll need a negative here. And it will have a moment arm length of 7 feet. Now I need to get the moment generated by the 14 kip force. And this will be uh, counterclockwise about point A. So that will be a positive moment. So plus 14 kips times a moment arm length of 7 feet, or sorry, 3.5 feet, 3.5 feet from point A, and then we just have MA, and again, this is positive because it's going in the counterclockwise direction, and all of that has to equal zero. So we then have, let's see, we have, oh, negative 140 kip feet, uh, let's see, uh, 14 times 3.5, what does that come to? Calculator, uh, 14 times 3.5, that comes to, uh, that is not correct, that comes to 49. So, probably could have done that in my head, but oh well. 49 kip feet plus MA. And all of this then equals zero. Then we'll go over to the other board, over here, to continue this. So, uh, therefore, MA is going to simply equal, uh, if I bring everything to the left-hand side of the equation, that's going to be 140 kip feet uh, minus 49 kip feet. And that will then be, uh, let's see, that would then come to, uh, that would be 91 kip feet, if I did that math correctly. So we now have our moment at point A and our shear at point A. Okay, assuming we didn't make any math errors, which is certainly possible. Uh, next, I want to go ahead and do the same thing for point B. So uh, let's do a, so now let's again draw a free body diagram. And we're going to draw a free body diagram of uh, the beam from the left hand side to point B. So we have our left hand side and we have point B. This thing has a length of 10 feet and a distributed load across of that same two kips per foot. That same two kip per foot uh, uniform load across the top. And we'll, ha we'll still have that 20 kip reaction force on the left hand side, or at the left support. So a 20 kip force there. Now I do need to find the equivalent point load of this distributed load, and this is not going to be terribly difficult. That's just two kips per foot times 10 feet. Or I could put a point load of, I could say this is a point load of just 20 kips. And then I will need the dimensions, or I need to know where it is, especially in relation to point B, because that's where I'm going to be taking moments about. And so that is in the center, so it's just going to be 5 feet and 5 feet uh, without uh, too much difficulty. Now I can go ahead and do the summation of forces in the vertical direction. And I'll have pointing up, oh, I forgot one thing on my free body diagram. We're probably yelling at the screen right now. And that is I need my downward shear force. VB, again, uh, clockwise, again, um, a downward force on the right-hand side of an element. It represents positive shear, and we're assuming positive shear in a moment. And then we have the same uh, counterclockwise positive moment on the right-hand side of the element. So we have MB here. So the summation of forces in the vertical direction, then. I have uh, 20 kips upward minus that equivalent point force of 20 kips downward. Again, this 20 kip force upward is from the reaction, and the 20 kip force downward is negative, and that's the equivalent point force across the beam. And then minus VB equals zero. Well, this obviously cancels out, and VB is equal to zero, which is exactly what we would expect for a uniform load simply supported beam. Now, uh, the summation of moments, uh, I'm going to to get the moment at B, I'm going to take a summation of moments about B. So a summation of moments about point B counterclockwise positive. Uh, let's see, I need to have my reaction force, and that's going to be a negative or clockwise moment about point B. So minus 20 kips times the moment arm length of 10 feet. Then 
uh, a positive moment of 20 kips times a moment on length of 5 feet. Positive because it is counterclockwise rotation about 20 feet, uh, plus 20 kips times a moment arm length of 5 feet. And then plus MB, uh, and MB is positive because it is a counterclockwise rotation about point B. Plus MB, and all this is zero because we are assuming that we're not flying through the air, which would be bad. <laughs> um, so MB then, if I calculate MB, that's going to be, if I just bring, if I bring, uh, let's see, if I bring the, all this to the other side, I would have what? I would have, um, let's see, that would be, uh, 20 times 10, or 200 kip feet, uh, minus 20 times 5, or 100 kip feet. 100 kip feet, and then MB, finally, uh, will just equal 100 kip feet. And that would be our, shear, our moment at point B. And we can check this result by knowing that the shear or the maximum moment on a simply supported beam with a uniform load is WL squared over 8. So let me just check my math really quick here. WL squared over 8. And uh, W in this case would be uh, 2 kips per foot. So 2 kips per foot times a length of 20 feet uh, squared divided by 8. Well, if I factor the 8 out, the 8 and the 8 will cancel out. I'll be left with 10 squared or 100 kip feet. So yes, our math is appropriate. Now, yes, you could do this using a, the simple example like this, you uh, sure you surely could just find the formula W squared over eight or other uh, shear and moment formulas in a, a beam set of beam tables. And you could just look these formulas up and apply them directly. However, uh, as we work through more advanced examples, we will see cases where you can't just simply look up a, uh, look, we, can't, we cannot simply look up an example uh, or look up a, a simple table, a formula in a table to determine the shear and moment. All right, so we've, uh, again, in this problem, we looked at a uniform load on a simply supported beam and saw how we can calculate the shear and moment at a series of points for this kind of thing. And our next, next example, we'll also be looking at shear and moment at a point. However, we'll be looking at a little bit more complicated loading. All right, let's go ahead and look at another example. So we've looked at one example, example one. Again, in the previous example, what we did was we uh, had a simple uniform load and we solved for the uh, load, or sorry, the shear and moment at a particular point by cutting at that location and solving, assuming positive shear and moment, and then solving for the unknown uh, shear and moment at that point. And that was a fairly simple load case. We had just a single uniform load across the top of the beam. But we can also deal with uh, a bit more complex, a bit more complex uh, systems if we want, or a bit more complex examples if we want. So I think I'll do another one of these solving for moment and shear at a point. Except uh, let's go ahead and oh I don't know let's go ahead and um, solve for it uh, using a different type of beam and a different type of loading. So let's say we have a let's mix it up a bit and use a cantilever beam this time. So let's say we have a cantilever beam. So I'm going to have a cantilever beam. And I think I'll just go ahead and make this, oh, I don't know. Let's make this 30 feet long. So that would be actually quite a long cantilever, but that's, a, that's OK. We're not designing anything here. We're just uh, working through some shear and moment calculations. So let's say we have a 30 foot long cantilever. And then um, let's apply a load to it. Oh, I don't know. Let's do something really weird. I don't know why you'd have a load like this. Actually, let me make sure I have the uh, load pointing at the end, going to the end of the beam to keep things relatively simple. And I'm going to put a triangular load on this. So let's go ahead and put a triangular load on this. And then, oh, let's have a maximum value of six kips per foot. So over the course of a 30-foot-long uh, beam, we have a distributed load that is going to linearly increase from 0 kips per foot at the left end to 6 kips per foot at the right end. And let's say I want to find the shear and moment at a point, oh, I don't know, maybe the middle of the beam. Let's say I want to find the shear and moment right here at point, oh, let's call this point A, and point A is uh, in the middle of the beam, 15 feet from the left-hand side of the beam. 
So let's go ahead and do that. Now, our first step, just like the, with the previous problem, is going to be to solve for any uh, reaction forces. And so to do that, we're just going to take a free body diagram of the entire beam. And looking at the free body diagram of the entire beam, we would have a, um, if I'm going to call this maybe capital A, and we have that our, our lowercase a there. Actually, it's a bit confusing. Instead of calling it A, maybe I'll just call this point C and this point B if we wanted to get into anything there. So there, that'll be a little less confusing. So A, C, and B, simple enough. And then our reactions at A, I would have a vertical force, AY, and uh, a moment, I'll assume positive reaction moment, of MA here a reaction moment of MA, and uh, that, those are the only forces on the beam. There, uh, because this is fixed, because this is a fixed support, we of course could also have a, a horizontal force on this. But because there are no horiz other horizontal forces on this, we can assume that the AX uh, reaction force is zero. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is get AY. And I'm going to do that by doing a summation of forces in the vertical direction across the entire beam. So um, now I, would, I probably should get the equivalent uh, point load of the uh, tr full triangular load. So let's go ahead and do that. So if we have a triangular load and we peak up at six kips per foot, we peak at six kips per foot over a length of 30 feet. Well, uh, I know that the centroid of a triangle is at the, a point one third of uh, from the uh, side, or one third of the from the from the large edge, and so my equivalent point load, if I call this P or something, uh, that is going to occur at one third of the of the uh, of the length of the triangle, uh, one third, and that distance is from the uh, the larger uh, leg of the triangle, the larger edge of the triangle, not the zero end, and then so that's going to be then ten feet. One third of 30 feet is 10 feet, so our centroid is 10 feet from the right hand side here. And I know that the area of a triangle is 1 half base times height, so I can simply say 1 half times 6 kips per foot times a length of 30 feet. And let's see, 1 half times 6 is 3, 3 times 30, so that should be an equivalent point load of 30 kips, if I managed to do that math correctly. I did not manage to do that math correctly. Oh my goodness, wow. I am clearly drunk. Anyway, that is 90 kips. So 90 kips, again, just from 1 half times 6 is 3, and then 3 times 30 is going to be uh, 90 kips. Anyway, so that's our equivalent point load, and for the sake of finding reactions, we can, uh, we can apply that equivalent point load and then solve for our reactions. And we can apply that at the centroid of the distributed load. So the summation of forces in the vertical direction, we're going to have AY in the vertical direction, and then minus P, which is simply uh, 90 kips. And all of this is equal zero because this is in static equilibrium. So therefore, AY must be equal to 90 kips. There must be a 90 kip vertical reaction at uh, point A. Um, and that's not surprising. In other words, the uh, because this is only being supported from the left-hand side, from it's only being supported on one side, the uh, entire vertical uh, load must be transferred to the left-hand side of the beam. And that's not too surprising for a cantilevered beam. Now, we want to go ahead and find a... Uh, I want to get the moment at A. And to do that, I'm going to do a summation of moments at point A. So a summation of moments at point A... Well, I don't have to worry about the reaction at A, the moment generated by that, um, because it ha because at point A, that reaction force generates uh, no moment. So uh, that shouldn't be uh, too confusing there, hopefully. Again, there's simply no moment arm from the reaction at point A. Um, so, but I am going to have the MA, and then the moment caused by the equivalent point force. And that is going to, about point A, that is going to be a clockwise or negative moment. and and A will be a positive or counterclockwise moment about point A. So minus, then, we have our equivalent point force of 60 kips. And if it's 10 feet from the right-hand side, it has to be 20 feet from the left-hand side. That all equals zero. So therefore, MA is just equal to 90 times 20, or 180, or 1800 kip feet. 
So there should be a total uh, moment on the left hand side of 1800 foot feet. Now, all we're going to do is uh, cut the beam at, so we got our reactions. We know that there, just let me double check my math, uh, 180 times 10, 1800. Yep, we're good. Okay, so again, we're looking for the moment at point C. And that is halfway across the beam. Now, um, let's see here. So I'm going to cut this there. And let's see, how could I do this? Well, if I wanted to, I could just say, okay, well, I have my beam. And I know I have my vertical reaction force of 90 kips at point A. And then I have my uh, moment of 1,800 kip feet. 1,800 kip feet. Now, I'm going to assume positive shear and positive moment. And because we're cutting uh, for this cut here, we're cutting at the right-hand side of an element. So a positive shear should be pointing downward. So I'm going to call that VC. And then um, moment, if, we're, if we assume positive bending is positive, then we'll have an MC here, like so. Uh, so that should be fairly straightforward, hopefully. And then we have our 15 feet distance across. And then we still need, we still have our triangular load, except it's not going to increase all the way to six kips per feet. Um, logically, if we go for, if we're going from zero to six across the entire beam, halfway across the beam will be at three kips per foot. And then um, the equivalent point. Now we do need to get the equivalent point load of this triangular load in just the piece we've isolated. And let's see, so that's going to be, so the equivalent point force is going to be at a distance of one third of the length of this, or five feet from the right hand side, or five feet from the cut. So five feet from cut C. And then um, the equivalent point force, like I could call that P equivalent if I wanted to, P equivalent would be equal to just one half base times height again. So that's one half times three kips per foot, uh, times, uh, that's going to be a total length of 15 feet. So that's 45 divided by 2, 45 divided by 2 is 22.5. Uh, 22.5 kips. So we have an equivalent point force of 22.5 kips at a distance of 5 feet from the right hand side of the beam. Okay. So now, uh, let's just go ahead and do a summation of forces in the vertical direction to get VC. So I'm going to do a summation of forces in the vertical direction. Again, what I have done is I have cut this at C and simply, uh, and by cutting it at C, I have revealed the internal forces at C, which are the shear at C and the moment at C. Logically, we could also, again, logically, we could also have a um, an axial force at C, but because we have no horizontal forces on this, we're not going to be applying any tension or compression uh, to this beam. So if I just do the summation of forces in the y direction, I'll have 90 kips vertical, so positive 90 kips, minus the equivalent point load of 22.5 kips, so 15 times 3, yeah, that looks looking good, uh, so minus 22.5, uh, and then minus VC is equal to 0. So therefore, if I solve for VC, I would get what? Let's see. So move this over here. VC is just 90 minus 22.5. So that's going to be, let's see, that is 70 and then 67.5, I believe. Uh, 67.5 kips. Okay, so ZC then is 67.5 kips. Let me check my math. Plus 67.5 plus 2.5 is 70 plus 20 is 90. We're good. Okay, now I may actually have to uh, break out a calculator for the moments. We'll see. So let's go ahead and do a summation of moments then at point C. So a summation of moments at point C, what will I get? Well, I don't have to worry about the moment generated by VC because its line of action passes directly through point C, logically enough. But I'm going to have, let's see, I'll have a positive moment generated by this 1800 kip point force, or uh, 1800 kip uh, reaction moment. So 1800 kip feet, positive. Let me just put this down here. Then I'm going to have a negative moment generated by my reaction at A. So uh, negative because it is clockwise about point C, so 90 kips times the moment arm length of 15 feet. Uh, then my equivalent point force of this triangular load 
is going to be a positive moment. So I'll have positive 22.5 kips times moment arm length of five feet. Uh, again, five feet from um, point C and then plus MC. And all of the, and again, MC would be positive because it is uh, counterclockwise about point C. And uh, then I can just solve for MC. Oh, let's see. So that's going to be 1800. You know, I'm just, I am going to just do this one in my calculator. So let me get a calculator and do some quick math on this. Let's see. So 1800. 1800 minus 90 times 15 plus 22.5 times 5. So 1800 minus 90 times 15 plus 22.5 times 5. And that will come up to be a positive number, but then I need to make it negative to solve for MC. So MC is equal to negative 562.5 kip feet. And let me double check that. 1800 minus 90 times 15 plus 22.5 times 5 minus 562.5 and I should get zero and I do. So we now have the moment at point C. So we have the moment at point C and also we have the um, uh, the shear at point C. Now something I would like to illustrate, um, there is another there is another method we could use in getting this and we isolated, when we cut this, we isolated the left hand side of the beam. But I, w I would like to look at what would happen if we were to cut and isolate the uh, right-hand side of the beam. I think that can be a little bit illustrative. So let's go ahead and do that. So instead of, uh, so we're gonna just make the same cut at C, but I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna uh, write down what we got as our answer, because we got VC equals 67.5 kips, and MC, the moment at C, and I wanna check my answer by, uh, I don't, you don't necessarily have to do this, I'm just trying to illustrate how you would handle cutting on the right hand side of the cut, or isolating the right hand side of the cut, and so MC equals that negative 562.5 kip feet. Okay, so I just, I just wanted to reference that. Now, um, let's see, I also should reference my MA as my, I want to have that written down before I go and uh, uh, do that, so I, uh, before I go and erase this, I should say. So I know that AY is equal to 90 kips and MA is equal to 1800 kip feet. I just wanna make sure I don't lose any information before I erase this. So I'm gonna erase this board and this here, and then I'm gonna see if we get the same result by cutting out the right-hand side of the beam and solving for our internal forces that way and illustrating how we would set up our free body diagram in order to do that. So we're gonna go ahead and erase the board and then we'll take a look. So let's just erase this. And we'll, we should be, if, we're do, if we do it right, we should get the same result no matter which direction we cut it. Or no matter uh, which uh, piece we isolate when we cut it. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. If I can manage not to put my marker. <laughs> Lovely. I am so coordinated. Anyway, let's see. So let's cut this at C and see what kind of internal forces are present. Now I am gonna go ahead and draw a free body diagram over here of just the left, just the right hand portion of the beam from C to B. So I have this here and I have my beam and the load is going to increase from three kips per foot to six kips per foot along that 15 foot length so it's 15 feet long 
and we will increase our load from three kips per foot to six kips per foot. And we have point B and we have point C. Now, there are no reaction forces at B, and the reason for that is that that is a free end. This is only supported at the fixed end on the right hand, on the left hand side of the beam, so there are no reaction forces at B that we need to worry about. However, when we cut it at C, we reveal our um, internal forces. Now, if you remember for a moment, our positive moment looks like this, something like this. That's positive moment. And so here we're on the left hand side of the beam. So if I want to assume positive moment, which is what I usually do, I usually just assume positive moment is present in a beam. And then if I get a negative number, I just know it's in negative curvature. And so uh, I'm going to assume, because I'm on the left hand side here, I am assuming a clockwise uh, couple or clockwise moment at point C. So I know this is very confusing, but the, I know this can be a bit confusing, but the hard part when des when deciding whether uh, to have, when, uh, when making cuts and beams like this is what direction to make your shear and moment arrows. And the key is if I'm cutting on the right hand side of an element and isolating things to the left, then my revealed force will be counterclockwise if I'm assuming positive. And if I isolate the right hand side of a cut like this, my positive moment arrow will be in the clockwise direction. Then, if we remember our notation for positive shear, like this, we have something like this, where we have a, if we're on the right-hand side of an element like we were previously, you'll have a downward shear arrow, and if on the left-hand side of the element, positive shear represents an upward arrow. So we would have a VC here. Now, I'm gonna break this, so we have our, uh, we have our internal forces revealed. Now, I want to break this uh, trapezoidal force into two, components here. And I'm going to have a rectangle and a, uh, I'm of course, I'm going to, if I break a trapezoid uh, into its components, not, well, not really components, I should say this isn't a, you know, this isn't a force vector, but if I break it into its uh, two pieces, I would have a, uh, a rectangular load and a triangular load. So let's do that. And I think I'll do that down there. So let's do that. I'm gonna, I want to find basically two equivalent point forces and then uh, there are respective distances. Uh, respective distances from the right hand side. So let's do that. And I'll do that over here. Okay. So first let's do the rectangular load. And we're going to increase from three to six. So our, we have a uniform load then of three kips per foot. Three kips per foot, a length of 15 feet. And so therefore our equivalent point load is simply going to be uh, 45 kips, just three times 45, uh, 45 kips at a distance of 7.5 feet. And this is point uh, B over here. Uh, 7.5 feet from point B. All right. Then I'm going to have a triangular load. And that is going to increase from 0 to 3. Again, what I actually have is a trapezoidal load that increases from 3 to 6, but I'm breaking that up into two separate loads, a, tri a uniform load of 3 uh, kips per foot and a triangular load that increases from 0 to 3 kips per foot as shown here. And uh, let's see, the equivalent point load is going to be just one half base times height. This is the same 15 feet again at point B with, for, uh, with point B here and uh, point C here and point C here. And so P is one half base times height. So one half times 15 times three. So that is 22.5 kips. And our, uh, our distance, so we have a uh, an equivalent point load for this one of 22.5. 22.5 kips at a distance of um, five feet. Again, one third of the distance from the, uh, lar the large leg, um, from, the, uh, from the, the, for lack of a better word, the fat end of the triangle. And then um, that'll be at a distance of five feet from point B. So we have this and now we can go and calculate our 
um, moments. Actually, let me go ahead or uh, share in a moment. And before I do this, I'm going to draw sort of a simplified free body diagram. And hopefully this will make uh, determining the shear moment a little bit more easy to visualize. So I'm going to literally in my diagram, my free body diagram, uh, I'm literally just going to replace my, um, I'm literally going to replace my distributed load with these two point loads. I have my VC still and my MC. However, I have no, um, I still of course have no uh, forces at B because that is a free end. Now I will have my uh, two equivalent point loads. I'm going to have my 45 kip uh, down, my uh, 45 kip load, which is um, again equivalent to the uniform load, uh, the uniform three kips per foot across the top, and then I'll have a 22.5 one, 22.5 kips, and this one is located at a distance from point B. The 45 kip one is located 7.5 feet. And this is, and the 22.5 kip is located at a uh, distance of five feet. Or if I now, what I really want to do is take moments from this end, and that's not that's what I'm actually going to be doing. So this then is 7.5 feet, and this one here is must be 10 feet. Okay. So summation of forces to get the uh, VC, I can just do the summation of forces in the vertical direction. So, so summation of forces in the y direction, I'll have VC. Uh, plus, actually minus uh, 45 minus 22.5. And all of this equals zero because this is in static equilibrium. And indeed, I get VC equals that same 67.5 kips. Just by solving, uh, moving, uh, combining this together and moving to the right hand side. So VC indeed equals 67.5 kips. And finally, let's go ahead and get the moment. Uh, the moment at C, and if I just do a summation of moments at point C here, uh, then I'm not going to have to worry about the MC again, or sorry, the moment generated by the shear at C, because the shear at C has no moment arm at point C. So I'll have negative MC, negative because in this case it is a clockwise moment about point C, uh, then I'll have a, uh, and these two will be negative moments as well, so minus 45 kips times a moment arm length of, of uh, 7.5 feet uh, minus 22.5 kips times a moment arm length of 10 feet. Again, all I'm doing is taking the moments about C uh, of the equivalent point forces, and all of this has to equal zero because this is in static equilibrium, and therefore MC is simply going to be, I'm going to check to use my calculator for this one, although I can probably predict what the answer is going to be. So 45 times 7.5 plus 22.5 times 10, and yes, we get a negative 562.5 uh, kip feet. And that is our moment at C and our shear at C, which is exactly what we got uh, when we looked at it uh, by cutting on the left-hand side or isolating the left-hand side of the beam. So we see that as long as we set up our, um, as long as you set up your shear arrows and your moment arrows in the right direction, like assume if you, in other words, if you're assuming positive shear for both of them, positive moment for both of them, again, if you're isolating the left-hand side of an element, um, you'll want, and you're using this uh, shear notation, if you isolate the left-hand side of an element, you'll want your positive shear arrow pointing downward. And if you isolate the right-hand side of a cut, uh, or isolate to the right of a cut, you'll have a positive shear arrow pointing upward. And if and then a positive moment isolating to the left of a cut will have a, a, a clockwise positive moment arrow. And if you isolate the left-hand side, if your cut is look, if you're cutting and then looking at the, to the left of that cut, your positive shear arrow will be going in the counterclockwise direction. I know this is a lot, I know it can be tricky, and it's very difficult at times to somehow, to sometimes uh, uh, get in your head the difference between po you know, positive shear in terms of, uh, positive shear in moment in terms of the uh, local coordinate system, like with your uh, shear notation, positive shear, positive moment, um, and the global notation where you're doing summation of forces in the overall vertical direction, and summation of moments in the overall counterclockwise positive direction. All right, so that'll do it for this example. And our next one, we're going to start looking at solving for shear and moment 
at uh, any point along a beam rather than a specific point. In other words, solving for shear and moment as a function of x. All right, let's go ahead and get started with example three. And in this example, I want to actually look uh, for the first time at solving for shear and moment as a function of x. Or as a, uh, in other words, solving for shear and moment at any point along the length of a beam. So, um, let's see, we could do a, uh, we just did a cantilever, so let's do a simply supported beam. Let's get rid of that, and we'll do a simply supported beam. Although we could, of course, do any beam we wanted to, but let's try a simply supported beam. So we're going to have a simply supported beam, I'll call this point A, and this point B. And let's say we have a linearly increasing load uh, from zero to some value. Um, oh, what do we want to do? We could do, hmm, hmm, I don't know. Maybe we could do something like uh, 10 kips per foot. 10 kips per foot. And <clears throat> let's make this thing a total of, oh, I don't know, maybe hmm, 12 feet long. So over the course of a 12 foot long beam, or actually that's quite a lot of load, 10 kips per foot. So whatever, we're just working with the math, the, what, whether the values are terribly realistic or not doesn't necessarily matter. So what I wanna do is I have this beam, it is 12 feet long and it has a, uh, a line load that starts at zero and increases up to a value of 10 kips per foot at the far end of the beam, at the right end of the beam. And so uh, let's go ahead and solve for this um, I want to get the shear and moment um, as a function of, of x. Find vx and mx. <clears throat> the shear and moment at any point rather than just a single point as we looked at previously. So um, when, again, when we looked at this previously, we had um, we had a just a we were looking for just the shear and moment at a single location. Now I really want to do what I would want to do, what I would need to do if I wanted to get the full shear and moment diagram. I want to go and um, get the shear and moment as a function of x and then calculate things therein. So let's go ahead and do that. <clears throat> and to do that, let's go ahead and cut this at some location x, with x measured from the left hand side of the beam, like that. So x feet from the left. And we're going to construct everything as a function of x. Now, this is going to be a little bit tricky, but it's not too bad, ultimately. So let's see. <clears throat> we have now, in order to do that, in order to do this, because we don't have a uniform load, a perfectly uniform load, we're also going to have to construct our load as a function of x, which is uh, going to be a little bit fun, but that's fine. So let's see, we have a set of, we can, one, I mean, in terms of how we do that, well, let's just look at simple algebra. Y equals mx plus b, this is a, uh, this is a linear equation. Y equals mx plus b, or what I'm really looking at is w as a function of x. And the slope is just uh, a rise over run, 10 over 12, and there's no uh, intercept, right? Because if we treat this as the zero point, um, so there is no b. So it's simply w as a function of x is just, if we simplify the fraction, 5 sixths x. So unless we can check our math, when we put in zero, we get zero. When we put in 12 feet, we get, um, when we put in 12 feet, we get a two, a two times five, 10 kips per foot. So yes, now we have w as a function of x. Now, um, let's, go, let's go ahead and cut this at point x, isolate the left-hand side of the beam, and solve for v and uh, m at point x as a function of x. So, <clears throat> now, uh, what we do need to do is, before we do that, we do need to actually get our reactions. And we won't have to do these as a function of x, we'll just have to do them, oh, as, uh, you know, just standard reactions. So I want to get the equivalent point load of this, uh, of the entire load. And the equivalent point load, well, again, it's just one half base times height. The area of a triangle is one half base times height. So one half times 12 feet times 10 kips per foot. 
So that then comes to, uh, let's see, 12 times 10 is 120 divided by 2 is 60 kips. So we have a 60 kip equivalent point load. And this is going to be located at a distance of one third the length from the far from the uh, tall end. And so that would be four feet from this end or eight feet from the small end from point A. So uh, let's go ahead and I'm going to have, in terms of reactions, I'll have an AY and a BY. So I'll have an AY and a BY. Now I want to get, I'll just to get, uh, to get the summation, to get the, uh, the reactions AY and BY, I will just do a summation of moments. <clears throat> so let's do that. Let's do a summation of moments. And a summation of moments about point A, counterclockwise positive. Uh, the, the reaction at A, A, Y will not generate a moment at point A because, uh, again, there is no moment arm for that force at point A. And I'll have then the uh, moment generated by the, but I will have the moment generated by the point load, the equivalent point load, and that is, uh, that will be negative because it is in the clockwise direction about point A. So negative 60 kips times a moment arm length, not of four feet, but of eight feet, and then plus BY times a moment, and the reason BY is positive is because it's counterclockwise about point A times a moment arm length of 12 feet, and all of this is equals to zero because we're assuming this is in static equilibrium. <clears throat> so therefore, we have, oh, let's see, by, by then is equal to, um, that's going to be 60 times 8 is 480, if I can do math correctly. So 480 um, kips divided by 12. Uh, let's see, that would be 40, I believe, right? That seems about right. 12 times uh, 12 times 4 is 48, times 10 is 480. So yeah, that would be uh, 40 kips. 40 kips, uh, so that's BY. And then the summation to get, uh, to get to AY, I can just do the summation of moments about point B, a very similar process. And I'll have AY generating a negative moment about point B because it's counter, because it's a, in the clockwise direction, the rotation is in the clockwise direction about point B. So negative AY times its own its own moment arm length of 12, uh, of 12 feet. Then um, point P, the point load, the equivalent point load P is going to generate a positive moment about point B because it is in the counterclockwise direction. So plus, uh, let's say 60 kips times a moment arm length of four feet. Um, so actually, so I'm going to make my job, a little, make my life a little bit easier and just divide across by four feet. So I'll just have one there and three feet there. So therefore, AY will simply be equal to 60 kips divided by three feet or just divided by three, I suppose. There shouldn't really be a feet there. And so then that would just be 20 kips. So AY is, let's see, AY is 20 kips, BY is 40 kips. And if I, uh, if I do a quick, uh, just in my head, a summation of forces in the vertical direction. Now, backing up, <clears throat> I could easily have gotten the, uh, uh, the vertical force, about, uh, the vertical reaction at point A just by doing a summation of forces in the vertical direction after getting BY. However, the nice thing about doing this is that now I can just um, check my results by doing a summation of forces in the vertical direction. So I have this, and now I can just go and um, so I can so if I do I, if I now go and check that result, 40 plus 20 is a total of uh, 60 kip reaction force in the vertical direction, and that is equivalent. That is equal to our um, overall uh, downward uh, point load, equivalent point load from our distributed load. All right. Okay, so now let's drive. Now let's uh, draw a free body diagram, and we'll use that to determine our um, our shear and moment as a function of x. So I'm gonna have my oh, let's see. I'm gonna have my free body diagram, and again, I'm cutting this at point x, and so by is not gonna show up on here because I'm cutting it. I'm gonna cut it at point x and isolate the left hand side. Although you could certainly isolate the right-hand side using using the process we looked at in the previous example. So we're going to have <clears throat> a 20 kip vertical force 
at point A, and then we'll have a, a line load, or sorry, a triangular uh, line load increasing from zero, not up to 10 kips per foot, but up to 5 6 times x. Again, what we have done is we have gone and calculated our, um, we have gone and calculated our uh, line load, our distributed load as a function of x. And so if I cut this at point x, I know that there is a peak load of 5 6 x at point x in this triangular load. Then I can go and say, okay, well, I need to think, I need to think about what kind of forces I've revealed when I've cut this. Well, I've cut it at x, and I've isolated the left-hand side of the cut. And so, as we recall from our uh, notation on shear, positive shear, if we're looking at the left-hand side of an element, the shear arrow is pointing up, and if we're on the right-hand side of the element, uh, the shear arrow is pointing down. So, if we're on the right-hand side of an element here, and if we're assuming positive shear, then we would have a downward pointed, um, we would have a downward pointed shear arrow there. And positive moment, well, let's see, let's think about that. Positive moment is like this, and if we're on the right-hand side of an element, then we will have a positive moment like this. So and I'll, I'm just going to call these Vx and Mx. Okay, now I need to find an equation. Now, if I'm going to do a balance of moments, the easiest way to do that will be to do a, a same kind of equivalent point load approach. And so I'm going to find an equivalent point load, not as a single value, but as a function of x. So because of that, I'll call that px. Now in terms of distance, that's not going to be too bad. I know where the centroid of a triangle is, and it's just going to be at a distance of x over 3 from point x. Again, it's one third. The entire triangle is a width of x, uh, and so the centroid of that triangle is at x over 3. Simple enough. And then px, I can just get that as a function of x. That's just one half base times height, or the area of a triangle is just one half base times height. So that is one half times the base of x times a height of 5 sixths x, uh, 5 uh, x over 6. So we get an overall equivalent point load of, uh, that would be 5 over 12 x squared. 5 over 12 x squared. Okay, simple enough. Now uh, let's go ahead and uh, to get, uh, now let's just go ahead and apply balance of forces and moments to get Vx and Mx, and then the summation of forces in the vertical direction. I will have, uh, let's see, a 20 kip uh, upward force, the reaction at point A, then minus Px, which is 5 uh, twelfths x squared, and then minus Vx and that equals zero. And then Vx would simply equal be equal to, if I can just bring it over to the other side, and just say that Vx is equal to 20, uh, 20 kips minus 5 twelfths x squared. And this is in units of kips and feet, of course. Okay, so simple enough. Um, and then if I do a summation of moments, and again, I'm gonna do this about point x, just like we have previously, except when looking at a single point, the summation of moments about point x, I will have, let's see, I'll have my 20 kip force, my 20 kip reaction force, with a moment arm length of x, and it's going to be negative, because it's generating a, a clockwise moment about point x, so negative 20 kips times a moment arm length of x. Then um, I'm going to have px generating a uh, counterclockwise or positive moment about point x. So that will be px or that 5 over 12 x squared. 5 over 12 uh, times x squared, the equivalent point force, times a moment arm length of x over 3. And then I'll simply, and again that's positive because it is counterclockwise about point x, uh, vx will not generate any moment about point x again because it goes directly through the point. And then I'll just have plus mx, and all of this has to equal zero because we are in stat we are assuming static equilibrium. So finally, I can just solve for mx, and that's going to be, uh, if I'm doing my math correctly, that'll be 20x, uh, and then bring that over here, 20x minus, uh, that would be uh, 5x to the third over 36. And that would be our result for mx. 
And um, and let's see. So then if you wanted to get, so now look, let's think about what we have. We have the shear and moment as functions. And now if I wanted to get the shear and, and, and uh, let's think about what we talked about previously in the previous lecture when we looked at discontinuities. In this beam, on this beam here, there are no discontinuities. In other words, uh, ignoring the discontinuities at the end of the beam, if I'm looking interior to the beam, there are no discontinuities here. The load is, I mean, I, ha I, can, I, I use an equivalent point load method for calculating reactions and such and doing a balance of forces and moments. But um, the actual load is a continuous function across the beam. There is no point where the function you know, changes slope or stops or starts or goes from a linear function to a, quadrat to a quadratic function or you know, it doesn't do something like this, which you could absolutely have, or you could have a load like this, or you could have any number of things, or the load could just stop at some point. And um, so, um, when ca so uh, when uh, calculating this, we only need to consider one cut point because there are no discontinuities anywhere interior to the beam. If there were discontinuities somewhere along the beam, at that point we would need to isolate and um, we would need to isolate, uh, you know, to, to, to do two different cuts and work through the mathematics uh, separately for each of them. And you'll end up with a piecewise uh, shear and moment function. I'll be looking at that when we will be looking at that in the next example. Also, consider something else here. Notice that our, uh, let's look at the relationship between load, shear, and moment. Now you may recall from statics or from mechanics that there is a certain relationship between load, shear, and moment. Our load function, take a look at what kind of function it is. Our load function is a uh, linear function. Our shear function is a quadratic function. Our moment is a cubic function. And if I actually look even closer at this, 5 6 x and 5 12 x squared. Hmm. That looks a lot like an integral. And um, 5 36, or 5 36 x to the third, negative 5 36 x to the third, and 5 12 x squared. Those look a lot like an integral. So uh, those are little hints and echoes of the next method we'll be looking at in a later lecture, uh, finding shear and moment by, um, by integration. Now, if you actually wanted to produce a diagram from this, that wouldn't be that hard. We have, at this point, we have functions as a function of x. And so you have a function, plot it. I mean, I think, I think by this point, um, I think by this point, if you're taking structural analysis, I trust that you're able to, uh, you know, plot a simple function using either by hand if you're really desperate or um, if you're standing on a desert island or using your favorite, um, or using your favorite math program, um, whether it be a calculator, whether it being, Oh, you know, MATLAB or SMATH or MathCAD or any number of things. Or if you if you want to be really creative, you could use Python even. But uh, anyway, so that'll do it for this example. And our final example, we're going to look at um, solving for shear and moment as a function of x when there is a discontinuity at somewhere interior to the beam. All right, so let's look at one final example. And this one, and in this one, I want to illustrate how to. Uh, handle finding uh, shear and moment, uh, the shear and moment function for a beam when there is discontinuity uh, somewhere interior to the beam. So uh, let me illustrate this with a relative, oh, now for to illustrate this I will use a relatively simple beam or a relatively simple system, but it will illustrate the process uh, readily. So let's just do something like this. Let's have a beam with two different uh, constant loads on them, uniform loads on them, or, or on it. So let's say we have a one uniform load of two kips per foot, and then another uniform load of four kips per foot. And then, um, in terms of dimensions, let's say the, uh, the point of uh, load change is just, uh, the point where the load shifts is just halfway across the beam or the center of the beam. And uh, let's make it, oh, I don't know, mm, let's do eight feet and eight feet, why not? Okay, so let's give this a try. And now, um, the first thing I need to do, just like always, is find the reactions. And maybe I'll, maybe I'll go ahead and give this some point names. Maybe I'll call this A, B, and C. And in terms of reactions, we'll have an AY and a BY or sorry, a CY in this case, and a CY. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and do this. 
And in terms of equivalent point loads, well, this is actually going to be relatively simple. Our equivalent point loads for our two uniform loads, uh, 8 feet or 4 kips per foot times the length of 8 feet is a total of 32 kips. And that will, of course, be at the centroid of this or simply 4 feet uh, from point A. And very similar here, 2 kips per foot times a uh, length of 8 feet is uh, 16 kips. 16 kips, and that will be located at a distance of 4 feet from point C. Uh, or, or, let me actually get the dimension in there, derp. And that is 4 feet from point C. Okay, uh, then, so we have that, 4 feet, and of course this is 4 feet here, and this is 4 feet here. So, uh, let's go ahead and get the reactions. First, I'll do a balance of moments about point A, and just like with the previous example, I'm going to go ahead and get these using a balance of moments and then check the my results uh, using a summation of forces in the vertical direction. It's a little bit more uh, lengthy in time, it's a little bit more involved calculation, but it does give you a uh, means of checking your work, which is always useful, especially when you're doing a problem uh, off the top of your head, which is always dangerous. So uh, summation of moments about point A will have a negative moment, again, about point A, will have a negative moment generated by the 32 kip uh, equivalent point load for this first uh, chunk of load. So negative 32 kips times a moment arm length of 4 feet. Then say also a, a negative moment of the 16 kip equivalent point force. So minus 16 kips times a moment arm length of 12 feet. And then uh, CY at this point is going to generate a positive moment about point A because that is a uh, counterclockwise rotation about point A. So plus CY times the moment arm length of 16 feet. And all of this, of course, equals zero because this is in static equilibrium, we're assuming. Then I think I'll make my life a little bit easier by just dividing, dividing across by four feet. And so that just becomes a one, uh, that becomes a three, and that becomes a four. So then we, th we then have, let's see, we'll have, oh, we'll have negative 32 kips, uh, negative 32 kips minus 16 kips times 3 uh, plus 4 cy equals 0. Um, so that this will be uh, 48 together. Well, no, no, actually not 48. That will be, uh, this will be 48. So 32 uh times 16 times 2 is 32, plus another one is 48. So we have negative 32 minus 48 uh, kips, kips plus 4 cy is equal to 0. Uh, let's see, 48 plus 32, that's going to be 80. So negative 80 uh, kips plus 4 cy is equal to 0. So cy then is just equal to 20 kips, simple enough. Uh, then, uh, I guess I'll get the other reaction down here. So let's go ahead and do that. And to do that again, I'm going to do a uh, summation of moments about point B, and that will allow me to get the moment uh, this the uh, reaction at point A. So the summation of moments about point B is going to be uh, a uh, counter or sorry a clockwise or a negative moment about point B from the reaction at A. So AY times the moment arm, again, negative AY times the moment arm length of 16 feet. Uh, let's see, uh, times 16 feet. Then these two are going to generate, po the two equivalent point forces are going to generate positive moments now. So that's going to be um, 32 kips times a moment arm length of 12 feet. Uh, then plus 16 kips times a moment arm length of 4 feet. And all of this equals 0 because we're assuming static equilibrium. Uh, simple enough. So then, oh, relatively speaking, uh, again, I'll divide across by 4, so that becomes a 1, that becomes a 3, and that becomes a 4. So now I have, uh, let's say, negative 4ay. Uh, let's see, 32 times 3. Oh, that's a fun one. 32 times 3, that should be 96. Kips, if I can math correctly, yes, uh, so far so good. Um, plus 16 equals 0. 
And so then that, that is a hundred and if I add that together, uh, let's see, that is 102, 112. Okay, so yeah, 102, 112. So AY is just equal to 112 divided by four uh, kips. So that is, that would be 100 divided by four is 25. And so then we'd need another three, so 28. Uh, 28 kips. So 28, let me check that by multiplying 28 times 4. 28 times 4 is 80. 32, uh, yeah, that's 112. Okay, so, and just like I did previously, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to check my results by doing a summation of forces in the vertical direction. So summation of forces in the vertical direction, I'll have my negative uh, 32, negative 32 kips, minus 16 kips, the other equivalent point load, um, plus BY plus CY, so um, plus um, BY, uh, plus our B, uh, CY here, sorry, which is 20 kips uh, positive, plus 28 kips, our AY, and all of that, we'll, we'll see if it's, uh, if we had, uh, got the correct reactions, all of this should add up to zero, so that is negative 48, 32, or negative 32 minus 16, is negative 48 and 20 plus 28 of course is 48 and indeed this all reduces to zero. So that's exactly what we'd expect uh, if we have a beam in static equilibrium. Okay so let's then go ahead and uh, start working on our uh, reactions or so not our reactions our uh, forces in the vertical and our shear and moment as a function of x I should say and uh, let me just I, I want to erase this and give myself plenty of room to work so I'm going to um, uh, let's see. Actually, I'll just go ahead and erase all this, but leave. My, I'm going to erase all my work, but leave the um, AY and CY labeled on the board. So CY we've confirmed is 20 kips, and AY is 28 kips. AY is 28 kips. Okay. So I'm going to clear the board of the work here to give myself just plenty of room to maneuver. Simple enough. All right, so we have our uh, board cleared off, and now let's go ahead and um, solve for our shear and moment as a function of x. Now, um, remember, we're going to we have a discontinuity in the middle of this beam where the load uh, changes from a four kip per foot load to a two kip per foot load. So we are going to have to uh, do this in two portions. So I'm first going to cut it uh, here at an x on the left hand side uh, on the left hand side of the beam to the left of this of the discontinuity which is located at b and so um, i'm going to draw that for you by a diagram i have a, uh, a length of x and i have my vertical reaction ay which is equal to 28 kips and then i have a uniform load across the top of uh, four kips per foot Now, I'm going to also have a, um, thinking about this, I'm going to also have a, oh, let's see, I'm going to have a, uh, I'm going to have a shear and moment revealed by this cut, and if I'm uh, looking at the right-hand side of an element, my positive shear will be going down, so Vx and Mx, like so. And I'll also want to have the equivalent uh, point load of this distributed, for, of this constant force, and that is just going to be a, uh, 4 times x. So we have an equivalent point load of 4x at a distance of x over 2 uh, from the left hand side or from the right hand side. So now I can just do, okay, let's just go and do, um, uh, let's think about this. Uh, let's go ahead and just do a um, summation of forces in the vertical direction. I want to get my vx here. Um, then we'll have Let's see, upward 28 kips, positive 28 kips, minus 4x, minus vx. And all of this is equal to zero. And then solving for vx, I can just say shear as a function of x is equal to, uh, that's just bring the shear, the vx to the other side. So that's going to be 28 minus 4x. Simple enough. And then I'm also going to have um, a moment. And to do that, I'm to, I want to get the moment at uh, point x. And to do that, I'm just going to do a balance of moments. So a summation of moments at point x. Uh, this will be, I'll have a negative moment generated by the uh, 
generated by the reaction at A. So that is negative uh, 28 kips times the moment arm length of X. Then I need to consider the moment generated by the equivalent point load um, of my distributed load, and that will be 4X, but it's going to be negative, or sorry, it's going to be positive because it's uh, counterclockwise about point X. So that is positive 4X times the moment arm length of X over 2, and then plus MX. And all of this is equal to 0. So MX then. If I solve, if I put mx on, uh, if I bring everything to the other side, uh, let's see, I will have 28x, uh, 28x uh, plus, uh, let's see, I'll have x squared and then just 2, plus 2, actually that will be a minus when I bring that part over, this will be positive, this will be negative, and so we'll have um, minus 2x squared. And that also makes sense from an integral perspective. Okay, so we now have the shear and moment as functions. However, remember, we have a discontinuity at B, and this means that we only know the moment uh, right at, uh, or at, only at points between A and B. Um, there is a discontinuity at B, and that means that our moment functions uh, are, will not be valid beyond point B. We have one set of functions that are valid between A and B, but we do not yet have the, uh, the, equivalent, the same functions that are valid. Uh, we don't have another set of functions that are valid uh, from B to C. So let's go ahead and get those. Now, there's one problem with this. Now, we could go and... Now, um, I could sort of take the lazy way out and just like um, isolate, cut it at point X, some point X here and uh, calculate it from, and just I uh, cut out the right-hand side of the beam, and that would work. But um, the problem is that method, uh, there's, a, there's a certain consideration you need to, certain considerations you need to apply when, um, when cutting a beam into multiple pieces, and that is the, you need to consider the boundary values between those. So, okay, backing up, imagine if I were to cut this beam at this point here. Uh, that's fine, like if I cut it just, just to the right of B or somewhere halfway between B and the 16 kip equivalent point force. The problem with that is that um, I suddenly, um, when I cut this uh, here, well, actually, let's, let me think about that. You might not need to do a, actually, I'm not thinking about that. You might not need to get the whole, um, well, there's different ways you could do it. Um, you could do a, uh, you could just find the reaction, uh, find the shear at that point, or you could actually just go and, um, yeah, I guess, you know, that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll be able to do it without using the uh, intermediate values. We'll see that more when we get to uh, boundary values for uh, deflection or rotation. I'll keep it relatively simple and just look at uh, this right here. I'll look at just the uh, simple method right now. And so uh, let's think about this. Let me cut it at, now, now let me cut it at a point, uh, cut at X between B and C. So now we're going to cut it at an x between point B and C. Now, uh, let's go ahead and draw the free body diagram of this. And so I'll have my 4 kip per foot, uh, 4 kips per foot, like this. And then a 10 kip per foot, or sorry, 2 kip per foot, like this. Now, it's going to be very tempting to label this dimension x. We do not want to do that. We absolutely do not want to do that. Um, the whole point of this is to get a single function across the entire beam. And to do that, we need to use a consistent x value. If you don't, you're going to screw up, so don't do that. Um, so we're going to have a, uh, we have our reactions. We still have point A here. And we have our AY, again, of uh, 28 kips. Now, uh, we're going to have, so this dimension, let's see. Uh, this dimension here, that looks like inches, that's not right, 8 feet. Um, this is 8 feet. This whole thing now is going to be x, not just part, not just the right portion, but the entire thing is still x. So therefore, this portion is just going to be uh, uh, x minus 8. Simple enough. And therefore, if I go and get, um, let's see, I'll have my point, uh, this is point x right here. And so I'm going to again have a downward pointing Vx 
and a counterclockwise MX because we're on the right hand side of the element still of an element still then um, or on the right hand side of an element or isolating to the left of the cut those are the same thing essentially okay so um, then let me consider let me look at the equivalent point forces I will have a 32 kip equivalent point force from the full length of the uh, element here from the full length of the um, of the uh, four kip per foot uh, distributed load and this distance will be four feet here to that equivalent point load then I'll have a um, another equivalent point force here and I'll just call that P equivalent and that P equivalent is still just length times width it's still just a triangle or sorry still just a rectangle I don't know my shapes apparently uh, two kips per foot times a length not of x but of x minus eight so p equivalent then as a function of x um, is going to be uh, then that will just be 2x minus 16. 2x minus 16 so that makes sense um, and then our uh, district our the, the location of that uh, equivalent point load of the of the two kip per foot portion uh, is simply from from point uh, x here is just going to be a distance of x minus 8 divided by 2 simply half of the uh, revealed portion so hopefully that's uh, not too bad here then um, let's go ahead and um, let's go ahead and do a summation of forces in the vertical direction summation of forces in the vertical direction I will have let's see I'll have a positive 28 kip force uh, minus 32 kips for the equivalent point load of the left hand portion minus 32 kips and then minus uh, P equivalent or minus 2x minus 16 and then minus VX and all this equals zero so therefore VX is just equal to well that is but I can just bring that over there this is a four uh, distribute the negative that will be uh, that's going to be minus 2x uh, minus 2x plus 16 if I can manage to math correctly so let's see let me double check that that is oh let me think about this if I bring that over there that is actually minus 4 minus 4 and then minus 2x plus 16 okay looking good hopefully if I managed again if I managed to math that correctly um, and then that would just collapse down to let's see 12 minus 2x I believe and then uh, I can do a summation of moments about point x to get my moment at x and uh, that's going to be uh, let's see we will have um, our uh, reaction at point a generating a negative moment there so minus 28 kips times the moment arm length of x simple enough still just using that overall x uh, then we have a 32 kip uh, point for equivalent point force that's the uh, equivalent point force of the uh, right hand side distributed load and so that's going to be a, a positive moment because counterclockwise rotation about point x so 32 kips now the moment arm here is going to be a bit interesting it is this four feet plus this x minus eight distance so uh, that, that so x minus eight plus four is going to be x minus four uh, moment arm length of x minus four in that area and uh, we don't have to worry about the moment generated by vx because again vx's line of action goes right through point x so we can just say plus mx and all this equals zero because we are in static equilibrium then I can just say okay if I bring uh, I leave an MX there and bring everything to the other side uh, flipping the uh, signs around I will have uh, let's see 28 uh, 28 X minus 32 times X minus 4 oh so what is that that is 28 X minus 32 X um, and then uh, minus uh, 32 times 4 so that should be 64 128 and plus 128 oh, plus 128 and then um, I can say okay well then that just come, becomes mx equals uh, 128 uh, 128 
uh, minus 4x. Um, does that make sense? No, something is not right. Something is not right here. And I know something isn't right. Something is rotten in the kingdom of Denmark. And the reason I know why is because this is not an integral relationship of this. So I screwed up somewhere. I hate it when I screw up. There has to, so, you know, errors do happen. So let's just check our work. So, or uh, check my work anyway. So um, let's see here. The P equivalents, we start with our P equivalents. Um, that's fine. Shear. Okay, so I do expect shear to be a linear function because the load is constant, but this guy should be quadratic, so there's something wrong here. Uh, and it's pro... Wait a minute. I am dumb. I left out my equivalent point force. I left that the moment from the equivalent point force on the right-hand side. So, no, this is not correct. So let's go ahead and back up a bit. Always good to check your work. Contrary to popular opinion, I am not infallible. And when you're doing lots of problems, it's always possible to make an error on one. So let's go ahead and just erase that and pretend that never happened. It's not like I'm making some sort of recording where people could go back and see that I did something wrong. I could edit the error out, but you know what? Sometimes it's good to leave those in there. Nobody's perfect. And it's good to keep that in mind. Okay, so let's go ahead and do a summation of moments again about point x. Summation of moments about point x, counterclockwise positive. Again, I have the 28 kip force uh, generating a negative moment about that point. So negative 28 kips times a moment arm length of x, so negative 28x, 32 kip uh, point force here generating a positive moment. So plus 32 kips times its moment arm length of, of 4 plus x minus 8, so x minus 4. Then my, uh, equi point, my equivalent point force, and that will be a positive moment about point x, and this is going to be a fun one. This is going to be, uh, let's see, that will be a magnitude of 2x minus 16 and a moment arm length of x minus 8 over 2. x minus 8 over 2. Oh, doesn't that look fun? <laughs> and then plus mx. So let me just double check my math here. So we have a distance of x minus 8 over 2. That makes sense. Uh, 2x minus 16. And so now we are not leaving that out. And then plus mx. And all of this needs to equal 0 because we are in static equilibrium. Now. Uh, now we just need to simplify this function to get something presentable. And we'll uh, remember our algebra skills and do a some good old-fashioned foiling. So we have negative uh, 28x uh, plus 32x plus 32x and again minus 128. Then, um, let's see, if I multiply this, uh, if I divide across by, basically distribute the one half, I have, um, let me just go ahead and do this expansion to the side over here. I have basically, if I, I can basically eliminate the two and the, and the half by calling this, okay, this is basically x minus eight times, oh, x minus eight, it's a perfect square. That's nifty. So that would just be then x squared minus, uh, blah, 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 that would be 16x, yeah, 16x plus 64. Isn't that fun? Perfect square, cool. Love perfect squares. Um, just make sure I'm mathing correctly here. And that is the correct word, verb, math. Um, anyway, so let's go ahead and distribute that over there. That's fine. Again, one half. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so we will then have um, plus x squared minus 16x plus 64 Whew, plus mx, and that equals zero. So I could then say, okay, let's just gather like terms. Um, I have uh, 4x minus 128 plus x squared minus 16x plus 64 
plus mx equals zero. So therefore, mx is going to be, mx will simply be a negative x squared, a negative x squared, and then, so in terms of the x terms, I have a negative 16 and a four, and, and again, I'm bringing, on, and I'm bringing all this to the other side, so that is, so that is negative 16 on this side, at, well, negative 16 plus four is negative 12, so that will be a positive 12x on the other side. And then negative 128 plus 64 is negative 64, bring it to the other side, is finally positive 64. Lovely. Okay, so now I if I wanted to report a neat and final answer, I'm going to give myself a little space. I'm going to erase this and uh, write that out. And we can see how this works together, how these uh, equations that we have drawn then work together, or these equations we've calculated. So let's take a look at that. And this is how I would report my answer if I were asked to calculate the shear and moment as a function of x. Because again, we, can't, we don't just have one function, we have multiple functions, or more precisely, we have a piecewise function. So, let's just, so I just want to go ahead and formally write all that out, just like we would using good mathematical practice. Okay, so well, that is 12 minus 2x there. Okay. So I can just do uh, then vx, my final vx, would be a piecewise function. And that would be 28 minus 4x. Uh, for x is less than, uh, is less than or equal to eight feet or zero feet and to eight feet. And then it would also be, uh, beyond that, it would be, 12 minus 2x for x is less than 16 feet is less than 8 feet. Uh, so again, we see that we have a piecewise function here. We need two different functions to define uh, the shear and moment for each part of the beam because we have this discontinuity at the center. mx then is equal to, it's just our two functions, same dividing points, uh, x squared minus 16x plus 64. And that's that again is going to be from uh, x is uh, less than eight feet and then uh, greater than zero feet. And then finally, uh, negative x squared uh, plus 12x uh, plus 64. Plus 64. Um, let me see something here. Oh, I wrote down my expansion. That is not correct. I wrote down my, uh, I actually screwed up again and wrote my expansion here. My actual MX is this one here. Sorry about that. Let's just get rid of that and pretend it never happened. Just draw some trees, happy trees. Anyway. So we have zero to eight feet x, and this is a uh, twenty-eight x minus two x squared. That's looking better. And I knew something was off on that when I saw it because I was like, that should probably have a negative slope. But uh, anyway, we have our moment here from zero to eight feet, and uh, we have this is just going to be from uh, in turn this val this p part of the piecewise function will be from eight feet. 16 feet, or just need to write this correctly, <laughs> x is less than 16 feet. So we have 28x minus 2x squared when x is between 0 and 8 for the moment, and then once, when it's greater than 8 feet we have negative x squared plus 12x plus 64. And that is our final result for our piecewise uh, shear and moment functions. Now, an interesting, now if we want to, another way to look at this is we could see what happens if we, uh, now it, it is interesting to look what happens if we actually put in the boundary value here of eight feet. And so let's think about this. If, look what happens if I put in eight feet here. If I put eight feet into this, into both equations, the top and the bottom, or both sets of the piecewise function, 
eight, okay, so 28, so four times eight is uh, 32, so 28 minus 32 is negative four. And then here at eight feet, uh, two times eight is uh, 16, and 12 minus 16 is also negative four. So that checks out. Then um, at eight feet here, uh, I'm just gonna, you know what, I'm gonna do that one with the calculator because it is getting late. Anyway, 28 times eight minus uh, two times eight squared, uh, that comes to uh, 96. So 96 kip feet at the boundary value. So I could say M of eight is 98, is, is 96 kip feet. And then if I put in eight feet here, uh, negative eight squared plus 12 times eight plus 64. And I also, on this, this bottom portion, get that M at eight feet is equal to 96 kip feet. And that is exactly what we expect. Now, if you have a beam that actually has point loads on it, then you can have, then at your discontinuity, you will have jumps in your shear. And if you have a point, if you have a couple, like a point couple at a location, then you will have jumps in your moment. But as long as we're only dealing with distributed loads, if there's no point where the loads, where a large amount of load is suddenly dumped on the beam by a point load, then we should expect the shear and moment to be continuous functions all the way along the beam. So um, it, well, I should say not continuous. Uh, it would be, actually I suppose it'd be continuous, but not differentiable if I was uh, thinking in terms of calculus. If I remember my calculus uh, correctly, but maybe I'm not, we'll see. Um, so again, uh, as long as your discontinuity is not a point load or a point moment, or backing up, as long as your discontinuity is not a point load, then your shear uh, should be constant at the boundaries between different areas of the piecewise function. And as long as you don't have a point moment, and what, what, I, mean by, what I mean by that is something like this, where you have that little uh, point couple somewhere along a beam. And as long as you don't have that, then uh, at a discontinuity, uh, moment should also be continuous. Although I suppose if you had a moment release, that would also cause a uh, jump in your moment. So anyway, a jump or a drop in your moment. Anyway, so I know that was a lot. We went through a lot of big examples, and but I think that illustrates the basic method of applying the method of sections uh, for shear and moment calculations. All right, that'll do it for today. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Uh, feel free to leave questions or comments. Uh, in the comments below, uh, or feel free to reach out to me via email. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, etc., to make the robots happy, as we supposed to say. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, regardless, uh, in the next lecture, we'll be looking at uh, we'll be looking at finding shear and moment diagrams by uh, by uh, by integration. So we'll be doing something similar to this, except also looking at integration. And then after and the, then after that, we'll also be looking at, um, in a later lecture this week, we'll be looking at uh, finding shear and moment by, via um, inspection, method referred to as by inspection, or that are referred to as by inspection. Anyway, please let me know if you have any questions or comments. I hope to see you all then. And as always, thank you.